My name is Holger Detke. I'm working at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Sweden, Umeå. And I'm in charge of the Umeå Center for Wireless Remote Animal Monitoring. And this center is hosting the system wireless remote animal monitoring e-infrastructure, just in short, RAM, which is a relatively new upvamped uh, e-infrastructure for fish and wildlife telemetry data management and sharing. And I guess everyone knows what MoveBank is all about, right? But not everyone in the room might know about RAM yet. So what I will try in the next minutes to give you the, the big picture, what RAM is about uh, and how we cooperate. But before we start into this, uh, just a very short history lesson on RAM. We started out in 2003 as many other local initiatives back then, uh, tasked with the um, tasked with to, to handle data from 25 moose equipped with GPS, GSM callers. Uh, initially, we thought we will be done then after one year. But I mean, as everywhere technology matured, things got cheaper, we got more money. So things really got rolling. Um, the data uh, is growing, still growing exponentially which is coming in. And uh, then in 2011, we got uh, the task from the Swedish Research Council to upgrade the system into a national e-infrastructure called RAM2. Uh, we have been working on this now for almost three years, and we, will, we are close to the finishing line. We will finish up development of the system um, and get operational in July this year. So what is it all about? Uh, the ultimate goal we have in RAM is to build a national slash international infrastructure, uh, a universal database network, a database federation to automatically capture, store, share, and analyze biosensor data from fish and wildlife. So it's not only about tracking data. I don't like the, the, the term tracking data or a tracking database because, I mean, Heartbeat, heart rate, uh, body temperature. This is not tracking, right? This is biosensor data. The system consists of two major parts. The first part, in my opinion, is not that new, basically. Uh, it is uh, a data warehouse, a huge data warehouse uh, used for automatic reception, management, long-time storage of sensor data from fish and wildlife. Of course, we did some, some upgrades, a lot of upgrades there. Uh, I will talk about some of them later on. But in my opinion, the, the more interesting part actually is the RAM data broker, which is a federation node to connect similar data warehouses for sensor data, like our own RAM data warehouse, CanMove in Lund, MoveBank, Eurodeer, and there are more especially on the marine side, there are a lot more tracking biosensor databases around. And at this point, I often get the question, why do we need uh, a database federation? I mean, if we have the data all in MoveBank, then we are fine. Yeah, maybe. But what's about the users who, for some reason, uh, are forced to use different databases. Let's say you're working in one place, uh, the institution department has one system you're forced to use, all your data goes in there, afterward you switch to another place and suddenly you're supposed to use a different database. So suddenly you end up having your data in two different systems, two different formats. So what are you supposed to do? Copy paste into Excel or what? I don't think so. Another case, for example, what if, if you want to cooperate and the other guy has his data in a different system? Are you sending emails back and forth, DVDs? 
with data. And again, you, you are stuck with maybe different data formats. So it's not that easy to just merge the data. And this is something we want to, we want to really get rid of with the RAM data broker. In general, the system looks like that. We have our data warehouse. The data warehouse is fed by um, different sensors, different projects, different sites. Uh, people can upload the stuff uh, manually. So nothing especially, especially new here. But then this is connected to the data broker. <laughs> and other databases are also connected to the data broker. So for example, MoveBank, which is already connected, can move, which will be connected in a couple of weeks. And with this, you can, as a user, log into the data broker and with the proper permissions, this is very important, with the proper permissions in each of the database systems, you get, can get to the data you are allowed to access. So it's not that all data is public and you can get everything. We honor uh, the different permission settings in each database system. And the data is also aggregated. I call it, I'm not really sure if I should call it metadata or aggregated data. In, in, in our terms, it's, the data is aggregated into a format which is, which is then transmitted to biodiversity portals like GBIF, the yeah, Swedish LifeWatch, LifeWatch, uh, ECDS, the Environmental Climate Data Sweden, and Data One. This gives us the, the, the us or the users the uh, possibility to search for data because all data which is sent to, for example, data one is searchable. So you will not find the raw data, but you will find the data sets, what data is available, who to contact. And then you can contact the people, get the proper permissions in the databases, go in through the data broker and get to the data. The data broker, how does it work? Yeah, we have a user. The user logs into a web portal. Problem usually is that then you need, uh, again, a new user account, a password. Uh, and I mean, how many passwords, how many users do you already have? So we figured it's not really a point to build a new user password system on top of this. So what we are doing, we are using uh, industry standard, OpenID, um, which means if you already have a Skype account, a Microsoft account, a Google account, then you already have an OpenID. So you can use this to authenticate yourself in the web portal. And again, given you have the proper permissions in the different systems, you can then send in a query through the RAM data broker, which is translated and sent to the connected databases. The databases will check the permissions, send back the data you're allowed to see. And it is shown in the web portal on a map and in a web table. So what you get here is you get the data back in a unified format. Do not have to think about, uh, about conversion between degrees or decimals or whatever. It's just one single format. But another thing which is really important here is, I mean, we want to analyze the data, right? So if we end up having the data all in a web table, what we are supposed to do? Copy paste again? This is not really the way to go. Well, other web portals, uh, they built in very fancy analysis tools directly in the web portal. So the user is never forced to, to really get the data because you can do the analysis in the web portal. But I mean, seriously, do we really want to use analysis tools somebody else has built three years ago into, into a fixed portal? I mean, we really want to, we really want to, 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 to push the limits. We want to analyze the data analyze the data in a way nobody else had analyzed the data before. So in this you can't do in a, in a web portal. So what is necessary is that you can access the data. So what we do is we send the data off to a temporary database into a temporary table. And 
with this, you can, when you get, you get in a pop-up window then the, the connection details. With the connection details, you can just connect through a standard protocol, ODBC, which is basically built in in any uh, analysis tool, which is around ArcGIS, R, Access, whatever. Every program which, which talks database can handle ODBC. So you can log on, get to the data, analyze the data. It's a temporary database. It's a temporary table. It's only there for the session and for some time. So it's very important to stress in, in some, uh, some people are afraid that we are doing this big caching. that We get all the data into one, into one place and then it's, it's there forever. It isn't. It's just a temporary table and when you log out, it's gone. As I said, we are close to the finishing line. Uh, basically, in this portal, in the RAM data broker portal, all the tools are already there, but um, we are still working on the layout, so don't hit me. It's not very, it doesn't look very nice, uh, but we will fix this eventually. So what you have here, you can see here the different data providers, RAM, MoveBank, CanMove, a test provider we have, and then you just choose the collection, the data set you want to get to. We built in some filters in the next version where you can uh, limit the, the data you want to get. Uh, set, you send off the query and back comes within a couple of seconds uh, the data in the table. And on the map. We are using, as everyone else, Google Maps in the background. Um, but basically, you can you could uh, build in overlay any type of any type of map. The interesting point now is what happens if you choose two different data providers. So what you see here uh, here I've chosen uh, the VRAM two and MoveBank. I have permissions to the data collection Animal Track one in uh, yeah Animal Animal Track one. I send off the query and back comes within a couple of seconds the data on the map, Galapagos from MoveBank and Moose data in northern Sweden. If you have a look at the table, I can, you, can, you can enlarge the table, you see that you have a unified format and you have the two different data providers here. So actually we have data from two different data providers merged in a unified format in real time online within seconds. The last part I want to, I want to show you uh, how do you get the data into the uh, front end database, the temporary database. And you just choose it, you can choose between Postgres SQL and Microsoft SQL Server have your pick. Uh, depends a little bit on what drivers you have on your, on your local computer, what you are used to use. So we, we thought if we put in these two, the, we will cover maybe 90% of what is necessary. And then again, you send off the query and the results go back into the front end database. And what I did here is I used Excel, uh, Access, Microsoft Access, to link to the front end database with the connection details I got. We have some more time, so what, what happens? I said it's a temporary database, a temporary table. What happens, let's say, when you exceed the, the time limit? The data is refreshed after a while, and if you exceed the time limit, the data is gone. You have to resend the query. Um, this is also, I mean, we are talking real-time databases. Uh, it's kind of, kind of tricky. I mean, if the data sits there forever uh, and in, in the background new data is coming in, uh, maybe you want the new data. So the other thing is, let's say we have VRAM and MoveBank and somebody at MoveBank now figures, this, we, we do not trust this guy anymore. There, there's something fishy going on. We do not want to have that his, this guy has access. So at the, the same time they remove the permissions in MoveBank, 
for you to have access to the data. Next time it's refreshed, moving data is gone. So I think it's pretty secure. Uh, some words about the data warehouse. I, can, I, can, I could bore you for a very long time with all the fancy stuff we build in the background. I will just mention one. In, in general, said uh, we are, were in operation since 2003. Uh, right now, it's used in Scandinavia, uh, Croatia, Africa, different projects, 32 different projects, uh, 16 different species, more than 2,000 animals. Uh, when you compare this with, with MoveBank, uh, you will find that MoveBank has a lot of more animals they track. Uh, we are mainly hosting large mammals. So, of course, if you have birds, small birds, then it's a different story. You can, you can tag many more uh, individuals. When it comes to large animals, moose, brown bear, wolf, then it's kind of normal that you do not have these huge amount of uh, tags out. Uh, we handle automatically nine different tag types, meaning nine different providers. Uh, it's very easy to set up a new provider, uh, but in different data formats. This means the data is directly floating from the uh, provider into the database, so there's no manual handling involved. Um, the data is just there in the database and you go to it. You, have to, you do not have to think about downloading the data from the provider's website and then <clears throat> making a text file and uploading it somewhere. Forget it, it's just done for you. Currently, 93.8 million records, everything from GPS acceleration to body temperature, quality measurements on the, on the cell phone network. Um, and it's increasing right now with a, about 11 million per year. As I said, I could, I could bore you with a lot of very interesting stuff which is going on in the back end, but I want to just mention one. Uh, a, a very normal situation is that if you have two different sensors, GPS and acceleration sensor in your database, then usually you have to have two different tables because two different types of data coming in, two different fields. So what's, what's happening if you want to add a new sensor? Let's say body temperature. You have to go back to your database, you have to create a table, you have to create views, you have to link everything. So you have to do a real reconfiguration of your database or restructuring. And I mean, this is not something we want to do every four weeks in the, in the future, uh, each time a new sensor or a new provider shows up. So what we did is we use a kind of generic table, which is called a serialized, a serialized uh, measurement table. And if you compare these two, then you, you might already see what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean. Instead of taking a GPS position as one single measurement, we split this up so that the value ID 1 for a GPS measurement is always the time date in UTC. 2 is longitude, latitude, 4 is height, 5 is DOP value. Then you just need a lookup table defining this sensor. What, what means GPS value ID 1? Okay, it means UTC time. So by this we can just change in our lookup table. We just add a new sensor, define what measurements does this sensor take, and we are set. For the end user, of course, they want to have the GPS data in the normal view. You do not want to juggle around all the data. So we just build some, some views, some collections, which uh, transform the data in a, in a, in a more usable view for the, for the end users. But for the, for the database system, it's, it's perfect. The thing is that with this system, you can basically add anything. I mean, we are talking about sensor data, but I mean, a researcher in the field taking body measurements of an animal is also kind of sensor, right? So we could, we could add a sensor which is animal, animal measurements, define it up and add it in the same database, in the same table. We could put in genetics, we could put in camera data, whatever. So it's a really a generic system. As I said, we are close to the finishing line. 
Um, so we figured we will have a workshop of our own. Not three days, just one day. And uh, I want to in invite you either to join us in real life, uh, for everyone who thinks it's a long way north to, to northern Sweden, you can also join the webinar. Just sign up on the website and uh, yeah, you're welcome. I want to finish up with some words about what I see as the advantages, of course, long time storage of biosensor data. But maybe more important, you get a single logon, regardless of where your data actually resides, in which database, or what tag provider you have. It makes it very simple to merge the data because the merging is done for you. The data is already merged together. And this makes it also very simple if you want to cooperate in the future, if you want to share your data. You just set up the proper permissions in the system and the people you give permission to can access the data, join it with their own data. And of course, needless to say, uh, funding agencies get more and more into uh, wanting you to write a data management plan in your applications or a data publishing plan. And of course, if you, if you just put in that my data is sitting here, uh, then you have your data management plan done. Okay, that's it. Think of the data RAM data broker as a kind of ATM for scientific data. It doesn't matter which bank you're using. It doesn't matter which credit card, whatever. You have your, you have your log on, four digits in an ATM case, and then you just put in the, the card. Doesn't matter where you are in the world and the data comes in the same way the data broker works. It doesn't matter where the data resides, as long as you have the proper permissions, you get to the data. If it's a move bank, can move, RAM, Eurodeer, you just get it. Thank you. Um, Right now, we pull the data. I mean, there's not, not really a need to push data some, somewhere else, right? I mean, there's no need to have, if, if the data sits in, in, uh, in MoveBank, then there's no need to push it to, to Eurodeer. Maybe Eurodeer can have services for MoveBank or whatever. Yeah. This is, this is a very interesting point, and this is something uh, I think we can really work on. Because I, see, I don't see this as some VRAM system owned by the Swedish University or national infrastructure. I see this more as a kind of starting point of a federation system. So, I mean, if we could, if we could build on this, then maybe the annotation stuff from MoveBank can go into it in the future. So that, that we get everything in, in one place. I mean, if you, as soon as you start pushing data from one database to another, then you, you duplicate the data. And I mean, just because you want to use tools in this database, I don't know, then it's better to link it together in some way and use the tools. We're going to move on? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh,